So as I mentioned in our previous video, I've shown you the mechanisms for E1 and E2 reactions. So this prompts the question, how in the world can I distinguish between which one of those two will occur? Although that can be complicated if you're super technical and anal about being absolutely correct all the time, I don't like to be complicated, so I'm going to show you a list of questions you can ask and answer in this specific order, in order to help determine whether your reaction is going to be E1 or E2. So here's a series of questions that I can ask if my reaction is in elimination conditions, that is not substitution conditions, and I'll tell you later on how to distinguish between the two. Question one, is the carbon bonded to my leaving group primary, secondary, tertiary, or stabilized? Now if it's primary, then the reaction is an E2, end of discussion. If it's secondary, tertiary, or a stabilized carbocation, such as an allyl or benzyl carbocation, then it could be either E1 or E2. This is summarized in the following cute little figure, which I made myself. Once again, if your leaving group is stuck to a primary carbon, it can only be E2 under elimination conditions. If it's stuck to tertiary, secondary, or stabilized carbocations, then it could be potentially any of the above. Now if it happens to be one of those scenarios, then we have to move on to our next question. Question number two, which says, is my base strong or weak? Now you might ask, how in the world do I tell the difference? I talked a little bit about this in our lecture video coverage of substitution reactions, but I'm happy to readdress it. Strong bases have negative charges. Now there are some exceptions. Negative charges that are on halogens or negative charges that are resonance stabilized are generally weak. So when I say that a strong base has a negative charge, what I really mean is a localized, strong, potent negative charge. One that's not resonance stabilized and one that is not attached to a halogen. Now if your base is strong, then your reaction will be an E2. If it's weak, then your reaction is going to be an E1. Now don't worry, I'll explain why later on. Now here are some examples of strong bases. M here represents any of our traditional group 1 metals, lithium, sodium, or potassium. Anytime I see one of those group 1 metals, I can basically erase it in my brain and replace it with a negative charge. You'll notice that in all of these cases, I've got a negative charge on an oxygen that's bonded to a hydrocarbon chain, an oxygen stuck to a hydrogen, a sulfur stuck to an alkyl chain, a nitrogen, or an alkyl chain itself. These are all examples of strong bases. Here's some examples of weak bases that would favor E1 reactions. Carbonates, notice it's a resonance stabilized base. Alcohols, you'll notice that there's no negative charge anywhere. The only electrons that alcohols can react with are lone pair electrons, which are not as strong and as reactive as a negative charge on an oxygen. By the same token, water can also serve as a weak base. Thiols, amines, and in some circumstances, negatively charged halogens, iodide, bromide, and chloride. So I've now told you everything you need to know. Well, sort of. Let's see if we can tackle some examples. I want you to predict the major elimination product in the following reactions and identify them as E1 or E2. Here's the first one. In order to tackle this, we go through our questions. My leaving group is obviously this iodine. It's stuck to this carbon. Is that carbon primary, secondary, or tertiary? Well, you'll notice that it's secondary. Thus, it could be either E1 or E2. I have to go to my next question. Is my base strong or weak? I've got a sodium stuck to an oxygen. Sodium is a group one metal, which means it's going to pump its electrons onto the oxygen and leave it as a localized negative charge. You'll notice that oxygen's negative charge can't resonance to localize into anything. So my base is strong. I've got a strong base, localized negative charge, staring at a secondary carbon bonded to a leaving group. What type of reaction is it going to be? Well, of course, it's going to be E2. The base is going to come in, grab a proton off of this carbon, thrust the electrons in, kick off the iodide, and give me a carbon-carbon double bond between these two carbons. It also will do an elimination to a lesser extent using the hydrogens bonded to this carbon, giving me a carbon-carbon double bond on the right side. However, that will be the minor product. The reason is, of course, because Zaitsev's rule dictates that the internal alkenes are more stable. Here's another example. I've got the same starting material, 
being reacted with this molecule, tert-butanol. My leaving group is stuck to this carbon, primary, secondary, or tertiary. It's secondary, so that means it could either be E1 or E2. So I move on to my next question. Is my base strong or weak? Well, you'll notice there's no localized negative charges. All I've got here is lone pair electrons on my partially negatively charged oxygen. Thus, it is a weak base. So this will proceed by an E1 mechanism. This molecule will stir around in solution until the iodide leaves, giving me a secondary carbocation. And then this tert-butanol will come in and grab a proton off of the carbon adjacent to that position, pushing the electrons down in here to form a carbon-carbon double bond. We will, of course, get a mixture of both isomers, the double bond being here to the left as well as to the right. But the one that's internal will be the major product. Now this brings up an important point. Why in the world do strong bases favor E2 instead of E1? The reason is because E1 reactions require the leaving group to leave first, giving a carbocation intermediate. That is a very, very slow process because carbocation intermediates are not stable, even those that are tertiary or resonance stabilized. So if I've got a big, strong, powerful base with a localized negative charge, it's not going to wait around for a leaving group to fall off before it attacks that molecule. Whereas if I've got a weak base, it will sit around in solution and wait until the leaving group falls off, gives me a carbocation, and then do the attacking. Here's another example. I've got a leaving group stuck to a secondary carbon, meaning it could be either E1 or E2. Is my base strong or weak? Well, I've got a lithium, so I can think of that as just being a negative charge on my oxygen. That negative charge is, of course, localized, so this is a strong base. So it will proceed by E2. It can eliminate the hydrogen at this position, giving me, giving me an internal carbon-carbon double bond, or the hydrogen down here, giving me an external carbon-carbon double bond. It will, of course, do both, but the more favored product will be the internal one because of Zaitsev's rule. In contrast, we have this molecule, which looks virtually the same, but it's now interacting with an obviously weak base. Why is it weak? Because there are no localized negative charges. I just have lone pair electrons on this oxygen that is partially negatively charged. So what happens? It sits around in solution, lazily stirring until this bromide leaves, giving me a carbocation at this position. Now you'll note in this particular case, I can get carbocation rearrangements by having a 1,2 hydride shift from this carbon over to this position. Thus I'll have the internal tertiary carbocation, and my base will come in, grab an adjacent proton to give me an internal carbon-carbon double bond at this position, or a terminal carbon-carbon double bond up here or out here. The internal one will of course be favored by Zaitsev's rule. This example is slightly different because I've shown you some stereochemistry. Now I want you to remember that in an earlier slide in my previous lecture, I told you that you can only eliminate hydrogens that are adjacent to your leaving group in an E2 circumstance when that hydrogen is trans to the leaving group and in the same plane as the leaving group. Thus, when elimination occurs here, it will either only give the Z or the E product depending on what the orientation is of each of these stereocenters when I achieve that trans coplanar status between the adjacent hydrogen and my leaving group. I'll let you see if you can figure out which way this one goes. Now contrast that with this example in which I have the opposite stereo configuration at this position. Once again, the same logic will apply. I have to figure out where the rotation is going to be around this bond when this iodine is trans and coplanar with the hydrogen at the beta carbon here. When that orientation is achieved, it will dictate whether or not my final alkene product is Z or E. I will let you do that one on your own, but I counsel you that it would be useful to attempt to do these problems using a molecular model that you build yourself. Now, if you guys want to buy an expensive model kit, they are available. If you want to be cheap like me, you can just use marshmallows and toothpicks. I now want to show you some more interesting examples. Let's pretend that I asked you this question. Predict the major products of falling E2 reactions. Here's the first one. You'll notice I've got my leaving group chlorine right here in the middle, and this hydroxide base could do an elimination to the left of the chlorine or to the right of the chlorine. And the question is, 
which one is going to happen? Well, you'll notice that if it did it to the right of the chlorine, the product that I would get is this one over here. Now, this one over here has the more substituted alkene. That is to say, it is the alkene product I would predict would be the major product under Zaitsev's rule. But you'll notice by what I've written here that it is not the major product. It's the minor product. The major product is actually the one that has the alkene to the left. Why in the world is that true? Is what I've been telling you about Zaitsev's rule up to this point just a lie? No, it's not. There's something very special about having the alkene at this position versus this position over here that I hope you can spot. Don't worry, I'll point it out to you in just a minute after I show you another example. Here's one in which I've got a leaving group bromine here, and once again I could potentially do an elimination to the left of it or to the right of it. Here are the products I would get. If I do it to the left, I get the alkene at this position. If I do it to the right, I get the alkene at this position. The alkene to the right would be the more stable alkene according to Zaitsev's rule, and yet it's the minor product. Why in the world is that the case? Well, the reason, once again, is because there's something special about having the alkene here that makes it even more stable than having the more substituted alkene over here. And what is that special thing? Why are these two products our major products here and here? The reason is because these two products have conjugated double bond systems. This is encapsulated in the next sentence I've written here. Conjugated alkene products are preferred over more substituted alkene products. So don't use Zaitsev's rule to predict the major product when conjugated alkene systems can be formed. You'll notice that in our first example, by eliminating to the left, I get a conjugated diene. Whereas if I eliminated to the right to get the more substituted Zaitsev's product, I do not get a conjugated diene. The conjugated diene is more stable. Similar thing applies over here, except this is not a conjugated diene. This is a double bond conjugated to a benzene ring. You can think of it as being kind of like a conjugated tetraene. The point is, these conjugated double bond systems are very, very stable, even more stable than having the competitive more substituted double bond scenario.